most, so as I said, I'm a licensed psychologist, um, but I think more important to this particular conversation, I'm also a person in long-term recovery from substance use disorders, as well as I had, was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis when I was about nine years old. So a lot of my life has been trying to figure out how to manage pain, um, and obviously I began to turn on the substance use is in part to kind of address that pain. And I'm still kind of on a process at 47 of trying to figure out what's the best way for me to manage pain and do the things I want to do. So this is a particular strategy I found really helpful for me and for some other folks. Um, but I'll kind of do some, you know, talk about some sort of caveats with it. So my goals um, is to appreciate kind of the components of mindfulness-based relapse prevention and help you all see how it fits into the broader cognitive behavioral relapse prevention model. Um, oftentimes when you refer um, patients or you treat patients yourself from a kind of a cognitive behavioral framework, um, and if, if substance use or non-suicidal self-injurious behavior or unhealthy sex or overeating, um, uh, many of those kind of behaviors are oftentimes treated from this perspective. Um, we're gonna look at the empirical support for mindfulness-based relapse prevention, and we're gonna do a couple of little quick um, exercises um, so you all can kind of hear what they're like, uh, get a sense of what it's like, um, how you would refer, or not necessarily refer, but how you let patients know about these resources. Um, so first I'm just gonna go through the cognitive behavioral model just as a sort of in general. So the idea being, so I'll just put myself in this situation um, to talk through. So for example, I have over 20 years of, of being sober um, and I was at a PTA party like two weeks ago. And at about midnight, um, everybody's drinking pretty heavily. And for whatever reason, I noticed like, my goodness, I'm looking at people's alcohol quite a lot. And I'm noticing them getting intoxicated quite a lot. That to me was sort of this red flag, like, ooh, that's a high risk situation. So a high risk situation that could be environmental, it may be a patient who's in their old neighborhood where they used, it could be that someone has extra money in their pocket, um, that's oftentimes a high risk situation for people. It could be they had a disagreement with their parent or with their girlfriend or with their partner. It's basically, it's sort of an activating event, right? Um, so on the bottom, is if you had an ineffective coping response, for example, if I was in that situation I referred to, and I began to like really fixate on how much it sucks not to be able to drink and how everybody's having a better time than I am and thinking about how it tastes and all that, um, that's gonna go down this kind of ineffective coping and maybe even ask for a sip, right? Let me just have a sip and see how that goes. Um, that would be an example of an ineffective coping response. And what happens is when we kind of chronically engage in ineffective coping, we have less confidence, less self-efficacy, that next box over, that we'll be able to handle that situation again. So it begins to be like, I'm just kind of powerless to deal with stress or pain or being at a party or any of that. And oftentimes then we'll have a lapse. So we might drink a little bit, we might use a little bit, and there's an interesting kind of thing that I teach patients about a lot is this, and this goes for eating as well, for like a diet or exercising, is this abstinence violation effect. Many people, so that you, let's just say that you're on a diet and you're saying you're not going to eat donuts. And then all of a sudden you get tempted and you have a donut. A bunch of us say, F it, now I'm just going to eat the whole box. Huh. And it's, it's called the abstinence violation effect when obviously you could also go, oh, well, I had a donut, I kind of had a slip, I'm gonna go back to eating broccoli right now, right? But many of us have this kind of mindset of, oh, it's lost, it's gone, so then you just go full force. So oftentimes I teach patients who are making any kind of change about that kind of cognitive uh, trick that can happen to us and help them predict it and then deal with it, um, which ultimately that's gonna lead to increased probability of relapse. So on the top end, so I'm in that same high risk situation. And what I really actually begin to do is I begin to meditate. And I begin to kind of like quietly, not in a way that's like disturbing folks, but kind of in my own head, wondering what I'm feeling about, paying attention to how I feel. I've made it really conscious effort of going by the fire and noticing what the fire smelled like and felt like and, and the sense on my back. 
Um, and ultimately that craving or whatever you would call it went away. And that then leads to when we have experiences like that of managing high risk situations effectively, we get more and more confident. Um, so even in that situation two weeks ago, I was 99.9% .9 certain I wasn't gonna drink because I had been through those situations before, right? I had confidence, but nonetheless, I needed to do something to deal with it. And then that's gonna ultimately lead to decreased probability of relapse. So mindfulness is one strategy that you could use as that effective coping response. It's not for everybody. Many people don't like it. They don't wanna try it. They'd rather do something else. That's fine. It's one tool, right, in, a, in an arsenal of things you could do. So this is also, a lot of times when I'm talking to people about like the basics of stress management, these are all, they're, they're broad categories, but the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration um, has found evidence to support any one of these in terms of helping people have a, a, a better sense of self, um, as well as decreased stress levels. So it could be stress management, so that can be um, lots of different things. It can be um, intentionally watching things that are funny. It can be um, learning about diaphragmatic breathing. It can be um, doing uh, mandalas, people do that. Um, so that's one, uh, healthy eating, physical activity, restful sleep, and on and on. And, I, and basically kind of what I do with patients is I'll say, which one of these makes sense to you? What, which one of these particular strategies is sort of compelling to you, something that you've tried and had success with, and then I'll go from there, right? So I kind of lay, lay, the, lay out the, the particular strategies and see what someone would be interested in. And if they happen to say something along the lines of, I really want to work on stress management and I've heard this thing called mindfulness, then that, that's what we're going to go to, right? We're going to try and work on that. So what is mindfulness-based relapse prevention? It was developed um, uh, by our good friend Gordon Mar uh, Marlatt, who's since passed away, who's one of the real um, innovators in terms of um, uh, helping people recover from substance use disorders. He was always worked at the University of Washington. Um, so it's developed by him and his colleagues at the Addictive Behavior Research Center. Um, and it's been found to be effective for a number of different behaviors, including substance use, gambling disorders, non the NSSIB is non-suicidal self-injurious behavior, um, as well as um, uh, unhealthy sex, people who kind of react in, in terms of sexual behaviors. And its goal is intended to promote awareness and triggers, um, like those, those high-risk situations, your automatic reactions, because um, many of us, you know, you have a fight with your spouse, and your automatic reaction is, F it, nobody likes me anyways, so I might as well go ahead and eat worms, right? Or drink alcohol. Um, the eat worms, for those of you who remember that song, that little song, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and essentially helping people understand that chain of events and allowing them to pause, observe their present experience, and bring the awareness of the full range of choices. They could act like they typically do, or they could act in a different way. And we're gonna listen to one of these in a, in a little bit um, that you can access for free on the University of Washington website is that link there. Um, oftentimes, I may play it for patients in session, um, or I may just give them, um, let them be aware of it when they leave, you know. Um, so the goals are to increase awareness of personal triggers and reactions um, and appreciate ways to create a pause in what seems to be, for many people, an automatic process. Um, adjust the relationship to discomfort. This is what worked with me with pain a lot. I had to, at a certain point in my life, accept the fact that I'm going to have pain and accept the fact that I'm not going to be able to do some of the things that I want to do, but I may be able to do some of the things I never thought I'd be able to do. Um, and learning to recognize the challenging emotional and physical experiences um, and respond to them in different ways, um, not in, 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 in less healthy ways. Um, trying to nurture a non-judgmental, compassionate approach towards ourselves and our experiences um, and create a lifestyle that supports both mindfulness practice and recovery. And this is another thing I would just say really quick is that recovery for all these things we mentioned, people typically conceptualize it as being comprised of two paths. One path is your everyday behavior. So for example, in my life, I exercise just about every day. I do some sort of mindfulness just about every day, and I really nurture relationships that are healthy for me just about every day. 
However, I can do all of that and my mom can pass away tomorrow, right? And that's an acute stressor. And that can overwhelm what I typically do, right? So I also need to have strategies that I use in those um, more acute, severe, intense life disturbances. So you kind of got to have something you're doing kind of chronically every day and things that you're doing and prepared to do if, if that overwhelms your system, which happens to all of us. We lose jobs. We lose people we love. We make big mistakes. You have to figure out ways to manage that. Um, so here's some of the empirical support. This is a 2017 study. Um, this is a meta-analysis. So essentially it, it reviewed 42 randomized clinical trials um, with mindfulness treatments for substance use disorders versus standard care, which would be typical substance use treatment. Um, and they found a, uh, small to large effects in reducing the frequency and severity of substance misuse symptoms. Interestingly, but not surprisingly, for opioid use, medium to large effects, so essentially a stronger effect, and many people hypothesize that opioid use is very connected, overlaps with pain as well as PTSD, and mindfulness-based interventions have been found to be helpful for those issues as well. So it might be that people who use opioids may find even more reward from mindfulness-based interventions because it might address the pain and or the symptoms from PTSD. Um, and you see even like it, it impacts stress as well at a very a pretty large effect in decreasing uh, experience of stress, uh, decreasing intensity of cravings to use, and also opioid use in general measured by toxicology screens. Um, and then this is another report from 2014 uh, that mindfulness-based relapse prevention led to significantly reduced drinking and drug use at 12 months. So nine people, 8% of that sample used drugs, eight people, 7.8% 7, 8, 7 .8 of that sample used um, alcohol compared with typical relapse prevention, which didn't involve mindfulness, where 17% of the folks used drugs, 19% of the folks used alcohol, and then in comparison to your treatment as usual plus 12 step, which was 13% of the sample used drugs and 20% used alcohol. Um, and lastly, um, uh, this uh, study in 2015, Journal of Pain Medicine, randomized 109 patients with non-specified chronic pain to a mindfulness program versus wait list and observed a small to medium effect size, a Cohen's D of 0.39 for pain. Um, and then 0.37 to 0.71 for lower anxiety, depression, higher psychological well-being, and feeling in control of pain. So it ranged from 0.37 to 0.71. So you get into that kind of medium effect size for those symptoms there. Um, so there's quite a bit of growing evidence to suggest that for some people and for certain issues, um, mindfulness interventions can be helpful. I have to say, I was talking to a guy a couple of days ago, it was about a couple of weeks ago, and he had no idea how to deal with stress. He was pretty early in recovery. And I brought up the idea of mindfulness. And he uh, looked at me and said, man, what do you think I am? Some kind of hippie. Um, and I said, okay, so I'm not going to do, we won't be doing mindfulness. We'll be working on something else. So my point is you don't want to you don't steamroll with people with mindfulness when they're not buying mindfulness, right? You're going to try and figure out something else that's more in, you know, uh, intuitive or makes sense to that person. Um, so what are some mindfulness strategies? Um, one is kind of like what I described a moment ago is, is and these are things you can just t talk to patients about and let them try, focusing on all five senses kind of at once. Um, so even in this room right now, I can think about what the room smells like. We have coffee in the back. I can uh, think about the taste in my mouth, um, the appearance of the room, the lighting, the sound of the mundane, mundane moments, like me talking the mundane moment. Um, <laughs> and like if I'm drinking something or even like the way my seat feels right now, a lot of times when I'm working with patients, especially around PTSD issues and they're re-experiencing, I really help to ground them by them just focusing on where they're sitting is a really good step. And the fact that people are kind of contemplating the way they're sitting and how the seat fits, fills on their back and their, on their rear end. Um, Diaphragmatic breathing, I teach this a lot. I do this, my kids love diaphragmatic breathing, by the way. And I, and I got them into it by the old strategy where they lay on the floor, they put one book on their chest, and they put one book on their stomach. 
Um, and I say, you need to work on getting the book on your stomach going higher than the book on your chest. Um, it made a lot of sense to them. They liked it. And my son, bless his heart, would freak out playing baseball um, when he was batting. And we would practice diaphragmatic breathing a few minutes before he would get up. And even when he would be batting, I'd be like, dude, focus on your breathing. And it really helped him. Um, uh, listen to your favorite song or album. I have a lot of patients who listen to gospel music. Um, and it's not just listening, it's like listening. So you're contemplating the lyrics, the meaning of the lyrics, the sounds of the instruments, even isolating instruments. Oh, there's the saxophone, there's the organ, right? Um, and I, I might kind of, as I'm going through this, my point of this as well is that different patients are gonna, different ones of these might make more sense to them, right? So if I know I have patients who love music and like gospel music, then that might be something we focus on. If I have somebody who played music, like people in the orchestra, they probably know diaphragmatic breathing. So that might be something to, to practice with them um, or get them kind of reconnected to. Observe 10 details about something you know really well. Um, so even like I had a patient recently who was in my office and did that with the carpet was picking out the colors in the carpet and really grounded herself by doing that. Um, progressive muscle relaxation, which I talked about last week, um, there's some research that suggests with fibromyalgia, which we talked about, as long as you're not doing the tensing, um, that can be very helpful for people. I use this a lot too. I think it got me through a lot of my adolescence using progressive muscle relaxation. Um, and I may do a little exercise of this too at the end. In the breathing where you count from one to 10, noticing the beginning, middle, and the end of the inhalation and the exhalation. So there's a number of different kind of strategies. I know you've got a few more. Um, body scan where you kind of tune into your body sensations and breathing. And again, I think I'm gonna do this at the end a little bit with uh, um, progressive muscle relaxation. Um, sober space, uh, which is something I talk about in mindfulness-based um, relapse prevention, where you're triggered and then you stop you observe what's going on, what's going on in the situation, what's going on with you internally, what are you thinking about, what are you feeling. You breathe through that, um, taking the time to breathe while you're noticing and observing all that. You expand the possibilities. Well, yeah, I could drink alcohol because everybody else is. Or I could remember that I really like sitting by the fire and that it's also gonna get me away from this situation for a moment. And I can remember what it's like to talk to my kids about my sobriety, which is exactly what I did. Um, and they respond in that way. Um, kindness and just sort of like a conscious awareness of distress. Like I'm feeling really upset right now and I'm okay. I'm a good person. I deserve to feel better in the situation. I deserve to be kind toward myself in this situation. I'm doing the best I can in life and in this situation. I need to acknowledge that. Um, I always like the mantra too, kind of like that. I can do hard things. I'm going to do this hard thing. Um, mountain meditation. Um, this is in that mindfulness space. We ask prevention. Again, there's people who read it. So patients or yourself can just listen to it. Um, but you're basically imagining yourself as a mountain and then becoming the mountain and kind of imagine yourself as the mountain is, is night and day or passing over you. Um, and as trees perhaps are growing on you, it's pretty cool. I have a hard time getting with that one, honestly, but it's pretty cool. Um, a lot of people just through reading the Alcoholics Anonymous big book or their religious book of choice. People I've worked with read the Quran, they read the Bible, they read the Torah, you know, what, you know whatever works for somebody and makes sense for somebody. Urge surfing, we're going to listen to um, one of those examples in a moment. I use this a lot with people. Um, urge surfing is a mindfulness practice developed by Marlat as part of mindfulness-based relapse prevention, used for gambling, overeating, unhealthy sex, alcohol, and other drugs. Um, basically, the idea is to experience the cravings in a new way, because uh, you're going to have cravings your whole life, um, and to ride them out until they go away. And the idea is that you experience it instead of trying to avoid it. The idea being the more you avoid these uncomfortable experiences, in some ways it gives them power. So allow yourself to experience it fully, but in a different way. And I always remind people that urges pass by themselves, generally in 15 to 20 minutes. There's a lot of research actually that shows that urges pass, they may come back, but they're not never ending. But oftentimes you're in the middle of it, you think this is never gonna go away. I'm just stuck feeling like this. 
And essentially, like I said, we'll listen to it, but you imagine the urges are like ocean waves that arrive as a crest and subside. Um, people who are afraid of oceans, this isn't a good, uh, <laughs> I'm kind of being silly, but I've had people who are like, dude, I'm afraid like heck of the ocean. So we're not going to do urge surfing. Uh, we're going to do something else. A train. Yeah, right. Um, you can practice and become aware of urges. When an urge occurs, notice it consciously. Name it as an urge to use. Observe your internal experience, the thoughts, emotions, physical sensations. Visualize the urge as a wave getting stronger and getting weaker. Tune into your breathing. Focus on making your breathing slower and deeper. Breathing in fully and deeply through your abdomen on your inhale and breathing out completely to empty your lungs on the exhale. Notice the changing position, shape, and quality of the urge or discomfort over time. Be interested in feeling it as precisely as you can. Notice how the shape and intensity of the urge changes with the cycle of the breath. And a lot of times what I do with people, and Marlat would do this too, is that my patients will say, well, I'm with you right now. I don't feel an urge. And I say, well, you got an itch on your head? <laughs> and they'll go, well, now that you said it, yeah. And I say, we're going to practice with that. And, I, and basically the idea is that they're, gonna, they're going to process and meditate around that urge to itch to scratch their head the same way they would to react in some other way. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, so let's, we're gonna listen, we're gonna do a couple little exercises. So we're gonna listen to urge surfing first. And again, this is accessible, that mindfulness space through that prevention site right there. And the, 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 um, the, the, the things are right there. So your patients can just click on it, lay back and listen. <laughs> 